So you want to write for a really large orchestra or wind band. Step one, don't. Oh, are you, you still watching? And you actually want instructions on how to do it? Okay, well, um, yeah, so how to do it. There are some rules that we need to follow. Why do I, why did I start out and say don't? Because it is extremely difficult, it is expensive, and it's not something that everybody should do. In fact, only very uh, select people are actually successful at doing it. Um, and it, so like I said, just it's hard. Um, so we're going to talk about some various aspects of how to actually write for a very large orchestra or wind band. And I've got some examples that we're going to look at. The first rule that we have to explore is the rule of time. As the ensemble grows in size, the piece needs to get longer and longer to be able to justify the expense needed to get all the players together. Also, the longer the piece, the more the composer has the ability to explore all the different tone colors that are in the ensemble. We're not going to call for a 110 piece orchestra and only write a 10 minute piece. That's not economically a good solution. I wish there were a good formula that we could use. Um, so well, let's create one. Uh, let's say that our standard orchestra, where we have woodwinds in twos, that's two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets, two bassoons. Maybe our bare minimum for that is a five minute piece. Why five minutes? Because, well, that's something that can be put on any orchestra program because any orchestra is going to have those numbers. Now, let's go to woodwinds in threes. Why am I sticking to woodwinds? Well, because brass is dealt with a little bit differently. If I go to woodwinds in threes and I add to that a piccolo, an English horn, a bass clarinet, and a contrabassoon, or a third player in each section, I could effectively double that time to go, well, well, we probably should be justifying about 10 minutes in length because, well, we have to pay these extra musicians that much more. So we need to have something a little bit more substantial. Now, for every wind player above that, we need to add another minute. So, if I go to woodwinds in fours, that's another four minutes I have to add. That's 14. Well, guess what? I also have to add a desk of players to each of the string sections. Now, a desk is two players. So, that's another two violins, two second violins two violas, two cellos, and so that's another eight players. So by the time I get to woodwinds in fours, I now have to go and add four minutes for the extra woodwinds, and then another eight minutes on top of that for the extra strings. Oh yeah, and there's a double bass. I'm not gonna add a full desk of double basses, I'm just gonna add one. That's generally how that works with the double basses. So that's an extra, what is that, 13 minutes? That puts me at about 23 minutes for woodwinds and fours. Well, I need to add some extra brass to balance that out? Yeah, probably so. So we can start seeing if I keep upping the numbers, the piece has to get longer and longer. That's not a hard and fast rule, but it's generally a good idea. I'm gonna give you an example of a piece that breaks this rule, and it breaks this rule to its detriment. It is um, this piece right here. I have a copy of Richard Strauss's uh, Tylefer. Never heard of Tylefer before? There's a reason. This is his largest single work is in terms of size of the orchestra. It is an early cantata of his uh, about uh, a war hero in the Battle of Hastings. Weird, right? You've never heard of this piece before. It is massive. It calls for woodwinds in sixes. That's two piccolos, four flutes, four oboes, two English horns, actually seven clarinets, two Ds, two B flats, two A's, and a bass, and then five bassoons, and then 
has massive of a section of brass as well. Eight horns, six trumpets, four trombones, two tubas, and then on top of that, it's a full chorus and soloist. Why is this piece not played? It's only 17 minutes long. It comes in well under the requirement that we've got to have a, a long piece in order to justify hiring all these players. Now, I've, I've listened to the piece. It's not Strauss's greatest work. Um, should it be played? Probably. Would it be better to program this with another big work? Probably so. Um, now, this is really going to be too short. I mean, this, is, this needs an orchestra of like 120 people. And then a choir on top of that. Um, let's look at a piece that is successful. This is about as short of a piece as you're going to find to have a very large orchestra. It's, of course, it's Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. This piece calls for about 110 players. Woodwinds and fives, uh, eight horns, five trumpets, three trombones, two tubas, kitchen sink, the percussion section. But it's at 30 minutes long. It's right at that border of, man, if this were any shorter, would it be justifiable to hire all these musicians? <sighs> it, I mean, it's right there on the border. But the fact that those Bright Spring was, of course, a renowned masterpiece helps the fact that if you want to do this, you go the extra mile and you can hire the extra players. But it's just right there. The, the Firebird uses an orchestra slightly smaller and is nearly twice the length of this. That gives you some idea. Sustaining a piece like the Ride of Spring for much longer than 30 minutes would also be incredibly difficult. But this isn't what we would consider a mega large piece. For that, we need to go to something along the lines, maybe, Mahler 8. Mahler 8 is, we could rightly call a mega piece, the Symphony of a Thousand. That said, this is the most conservative of all the mega pieces we'll look at in terms of the orchestra. Why is it a symphony of a thousand? Well, it's because of the choirs. He calls for three separate choirs, two adult choirs and a children's choir. And so if we think of each of the adult choirs, 100 people, 50 people in the children's choir, that's an extra 250 people on top of an orchestra of about 110. And so we're looking, you know, somewhere around the range of, when all said and done, just under 400 players to do this piece because of the choir numbers. In fact, all of our mega pieces have big choirs in them. Brian's Gothic Symphony, uh, Berlioz's Requiem, uh, Leader by Schoenberg. Um, but I think a good place to start out is Mahler's Eighth. Mahler's Eighth is unusual. Uh, it is a giant piece of chamber music. What? If, if, if you've never really taken a look at the score to this, particularly the score to the second movement. By the way, there are only two movements in this piece, making this highly unusual. The second movement is chamber music. I mean, it is very delicate, and this is something that a lot of people forget. When you start getting larger ensembles, start thinking more in terms of chamber music as opposed to full-out bombastic sound. Yeah, that full-out bombastic sound is great, but you only want it for very, very small uh, portions of the music. So Mahler 8, well, it's... It, it's, it's delicate. It is very, very delicate. In fact, this may be the most delicate of the mega pieces. Though, you know what? Berlioz's Requiem has a lot of delicate movements. Uh, there's one entire movement of the, the Berlioz Requiem. The, the Quid Sum Miser fits entirely on one page of the score. 
In the Dover edition, it's on page 44. And it is scored just for English horn, bassoon, male squire, uh, cellos and basses. And that's it. That's not extravagant scoring at all. The, the following Rex Tremende, yeah, he's got, you know, one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, tempanists going. So that's a bit more extravagant. But if you want that extravagant big sound, you've got to also have the small stuff. And this is where the piece will get longer and longer in that we have to have these small, delicate sections. Mahler does this so well. In fact, in Mahler's Eighth Symphony, there is a single quarter note in the end of Movement 2 where the entire ensemble plays together. That's it, one quarter note. And even then, one or two instruments are still out. I don't think the celeste is playing maybe a percussion instrument or two, but otherwise, in 70 minutes of music, for what's called the Symphony of a Thousand, one single beat of music of tutti. That's restraint there. So this is something that a lot of younger composers don't realize. They want to use the entire ensemble all the time. And in doing that, we get ear fatigue. We've got to have that contrast. Now, there are two approaches we can take to writing for a mega ensemble. Um, we'll call them the Mahler approach and the Schoenberg approach. Why? So, Mahler, I said this is a restraint. Yes, he's writing for woodwinds and fives, but he's only writing for your standard instruments. There's no extra auxiliary instruments. I mean, it's... Four bassoons and a contrabassoon, four oboes and an English horn, four flutes and a piccolo, E flat clarinet, three B flat clarinets, bass clarinet, nothing out of the ordinary. Schoenberg, on the other hand, is also writing for similar numbers, except he has more clarinets. But he's writing for three bassoons, two contrabassoons, three oboes, two uh, English horns, four piccolos, four. C flute. Sometimes it's everybody on piccolo or everybody on C flute. Seven clarinets. And then the brass section, he's got Wagner tubas, bass trumpet, contrabass trombone, alto trombone. He's doing a much more diverse ensemble. Why does Schoenberg do this and Mahler doesn't? The choir is the biggest aspect. Yes, Girl Leader has a choir, but the choir only comes in at a few specific moments. The choir essentially obliterates any minute differences you'll get in the tone color. So Mahler doesn't need extra instruments for more uh, micromanagement of the delicate tone colors. Schoenberg can because it's essentially, it's always against a single soloist. That's a big distinction there. So if you want big and bombastic against, in particular against a large choir, you don't want a very diverse ensemble. You want to keep it to pretty standard instruments. You can add in something here and there, but by and large, if you're going against a choir all the time, you're not going to hear the subtleties between uh, a C clarinet and a B flat clarinet, or even a C flute and an alto flute. Um, now, if we do away with the choir, then our ears are entirely focused on the ensemble itself. This is why the Rite of Spring can have such a diverse ensemble where we've got the major alto flute part, two English horns, two contrabassoons, two bass clarinets, and bass trumpet and Wagner tuba, and we don't have the choir to hide and mask over. Now, then we get to the, the Gothic symphony, Havergal Brian. This is a 
fascinating piece and it is flawed in many ways. I still love the piece. I still go back to it and study it, but it is flawed and Brian is not the same kind of composer as uh, Strauss or Mahler or Stravinsky. He is, he's, there is an amateurish streak in him. Um, he is doing everything. He's got the massive choirs. He's got the diverse instruments. I mean, he's using alto flute and oboe de more and bass oboe and contrabass clarinet and everything you can think of except saxophones and Wagner tuba. And, and, but, he's also restraining the choir to come in only movement four out of six movements. So he develops the sound world first, then adds in the choir, and then there are long stretches where the choir is not singing in movements four, five, and six. So it works, but it's right on the precipice of not working. Couple that, this piece is also an hour and 50 minutes long. It's the longest of the mega works that, you know, it, that we can readily study. There are others. Um, that are not so readily available. But um, with uh, Brian, we're right on, on the cusp of what is feasible. Uh, incidentally, if we look at the, the Brian piece, this is more or less the realization of Berlioz's, what some people call the ideal orchestra from the end of his treatise on instrumentation. It's kind of along those lines. It's a little bit more updated for uh, England in the 1920s, what was available then. He's basically using all the instruments that were available to him at that time. Now, one thing I have not talked about is wind band. Why? Because this kind of experiment has really never been done in wind band. There is, as far as I know, a single piece of music that gets played every now and then that we could call a mega piece, and that's Gunther Schuller's Symphony 3 in Praise of Winds. This is a very, very large work. Um, I mean, if you look at the uh, ensemble of the choirs, he's asking for four alto clarinets and four bass clarinets and two contra alto clarinets and two contra bass clarinets, and that's just the low clarinet section. He's doing the same kind of thing throughout the entire ensemble. Where it gets difficult is this is a shorter word. It only between 20 and 25 minutes, depending on the performance. It's also exceptionally difficult. So it does not get performed often. Its size will scare off most band directors. Of course, I have written two mega works. My Symphonies 2 and 3. This is the score to Symphony 2. Uh, a little difficult to see on camera, but... Uh, it is uh, it is what we would could rightly call a mega work for wind band. It is right at uh, 78 players. So believe it or not, considerably less than any of the mega works for orchestra. It does not include a chorus. So why would a band of 78 be considered a mega work when? Orchestra, you're looking at a mega work of 110 or more. Well, it's because the the diverse elements in the ensemble. This is 78 individual parts, so therein it gets extremely difficult to manage. If we look at um, some of the uh, larger pages. Let me see if I can find a page where pretty much everybody is playing. Um, I, I know where the, the biggest one is in here. Yeah, so something uh, along this. And this gets very, very unwieldy. Uh, this is difficult, and that, by the way, is only four measures. That's two measures per page there. Um, so, uh, such, such a piece for wind band is extremely unusual. It also, uh, be, wind bands 
tend to need shorter pieces because well, wind players don't have the same kind of stamina that string players do. It's these delicate muscles here in the armature that will wear out very easily. So this piece right here is right at 50 minutes long. That is a, a good long piece for a wind ensemble. Typically, you're not going to see uh, wind ensemble pieces longer than an hour, mostly because concerts need to be kept shorter than that. Often you'll have two bands performing on the same concert, and if one is doing a piece over an hour long, the other band doesn't have really have an opportunity to perform. So you want to keep the pieces a little bit shorter. In fact, there is a single work within the standard wind band literature that is over an hour long, and that's David Maslanka's Symphony No. 9. Um, and Maslanka can get away with this because vast portions of his Symphony No. 9 are very chamber uh, ensemble oriented. And it's uh, like alto saxophone and piano for a long extended time. There's also an extended part for narrator. So this becomes a lot easier for a band to deal with if you can just take that part and say go rehearse this outside of rehearsal time. Just the piano and the alto sax player go and then you've got that done and you don't have to worry about the rehearsal time because if you want to run a full piece like that in rehearsal, you've got to have an extra long rehearsal. So you, there oftentimes you can't run the entire piece in a single rehearsal. That can be problematic. So one reason I kept this piece under an hour. Symphony 3, on the other hand, is 70 minutes. So it's 20 minutes longer than this. And it is designed to be an entire concert. So you're not going to... Uh, program anything else on that concert really. Um, it also needs another 20 players in addition to what's used here in Symphony 2. Both of these pieces are extremely difficult to program. I've been working on trying to get somebody interested in performing one of them for several years now. Um, who knows? Symphony 4 on the other hand, my personal Symphony 4, um, very accessible performance schedule from about a year from now. Uh, so we're working on that. Um, but so it, some some other things to think about. So the more diverse your instruments are, so say you want to score for some weird esoteric saxophone, you have to justify that in the music. Always think the function of the music has to come first. Don't write a piece so that you, know, you can show off this instrument. Show, write the music and then say, well, this needs to be done on this instrument. The music needs to come first, not the instrument, then the music. Now, some people might take exception to that, but by and large, that's true. The music is the most essential part. Take, for instance, the idea, say I want to include a recorder uh, group in my ensemble. Just happen to have a recorder right here. In fact, I happen to have a whole bunch of recorders right here. What function will that recorder group serve in your ensemble? Are they going to be able to play through the entire work? No, probably not. In a loud section, the recorders are going to be useless. So what are my players going to do? Well, what do I want to use the recorders for? Is it just for a small section? Well, maybe I want to look at having a player double on that. And this is a big saber. So you can have uh, the recorder be a double for another woodwind instrument that's not playing in that section. You don't want to have all the woodwinds playing while the recorders are playing because, well, you won't hear the recorder. So there is some things you can do. One thing to keep in mind is use as few players as possible to get the effect you need. Uh, this, is, this is difficult to understand. And I, I've run into this in multiple cases. In fact, I'm editing a piece right now where I started out the score with more instruments than I will ultimately need. And I'm going through right now and deleting instruments. This is something I do all the time. On the other hand, when I was working on Symphony 3, 
Um, one thing that I was working on is I, I didn't expect Symphony 3 to be as massive as it was. But as I kept going, I realized, man, I really need to VC these clarinet parts. So what I do, I just I added another pair of clarinets. And something along those lines is totally uh, doable, adding just a regular B-flat clarinet. And you know what? An ensemble typically will have multiple B-flat clarinets. So I start saying, okay, I need to VC this, I need to VC this. And so I'm looking at how the music is dictating what needs to be done in the ensemble. I'm not arbitrarily setting out saying, now, I'm going to use eight B flat clarinets in this because it's a good round number. No, I used eight B flat clarinets because I had to have that eight part harmony and it worked best for the music. So function always has to be the key element. And with that, I realized that I've been talking nearly uh, close to 30 minutes now. I'll probably edit this down, but uh, I want to know what you think uh, about writing for these super large mega ensembles. It is difficult. Uh, most composers should not attempt it. It is, it is, not, it is uh, not easy to do. Uh, again, let me know down in the comments. As always, like, comment, subscribe. Oh, and I do have the Patreon up and going. And if you go and join Patreon, you get access to the new Discord channel. And we've been having a lot of really lively discussions over on Discord. In fact, well, as I've been recording this, I've been hearing the notifications go off for that. So join Patreon and then come and join the Discord server. And we're talking about all things uh, nerdy regarding uh, instruments and composition and wind band and all that good stuff. And I will talk to you.